from KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. I am dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers, military personnel, and law enforcement officers to stop the rioting, looting, vandalism. President Donald Trump calling for a crackdown on violent protesters as the unrest in America continues. The protests sparking after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. A peaceful protest followed by violence in San Antonio over the weekend. And a few developments tonight. Floyd's death now ruled a homicide by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner. This as results from the Floyd family's privately commissioned autopsy are released. And here at home, Alamo Plaza closing for a third night in a row after crowds left the area in chaos over the weekend. Sky 12 over the area tonight. No one will be allowed to walk or drive around Alamo Plaza until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. It is unclear how long the limited closure will continue. The city says the closure is meant to help minimize the possibility of civil disturbance and damage. Videos from Saturday night have flooded social media, and now the FBI is requesting some of those videos. They are looking for those images that can help the FBI identify actors who are actively instigating violence amid the protests. If you witnessed or have witnessed unlawful violent actions, you can submit your video or pictures to FBI.gov slash violence. You can also dial 1-800-CALL-FBI. Shattered glass, graffiti, several injuries. It's a sign that some may not have expected. The protest Saturday night turning violent with some officers hurt and others in the community left questioning who is responsible. This is the first time I've seen something like that happen. No justice! What started as peaceful ended in chaos with dozens of business impacted, windows busted and property defaced. The actions also took residents by surprise. Looters are something that is an unacceptable part of protesting. It broke my heart. It made me very, very sad. This viral Facebook post shared more than 5,000 times showing a father and veteran SAPD officer with a wound to the head and in need of stitches. Police Chief William McManus saying bottles and bricks were thrown at officers. We had another officer who was hit in the knee with a brick. At least three officers were injured. Police Chief William McManus making it clear the organizers of the protest were not to blame. They said that they were going to start at 5. They were going to march to police headquarters at um, around 6 or so, light candles, have a vigil, and disperse at 6.30. And in fact, they did just that. The remaining people were the agitators. <laughs> Those agitators first believed to be from out of town, but police learning out of the six arrests made Saturday night, many are from San Antonio and one from Uvalde. The ugly scenes from late last night certainly didn't remind me or anyone else of our San Antonio. Under other circumstances, I would say yes, I was surprised, but I'm not because of what happened in Minneapolis. George Floyd's death igniting a call for change and a fight against racism. Floyd pronounced dead after a now former Minneapolis officer pressed his knee on his neck for several minutes. Today, Floyd's brother reacting to the destruction around the country. Now what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. Just hours after the violence, many in the community showed up in support of businesses to help clean up broken glass and board up windows. It was a rally of San Antonians helping San Antonians. That's why local journalists need to be not afraid to go to work and, the, and, our, and our government officials need to let them go to work as the first informers and the public will then be empowered to make responsible decisions about how the powerful are doing or or the right the rightness or wrongness of what the protesters are protesting. That message coming from Gordon Smith, president and CEO of the National Association of Broadcasters, in an interview with our Detroit sister station, speaking about the importance that local TV news plays during this time of a pandemic and protesting across America. He went on to state how important it is for reporters not to be fearful and that the media should be protected from attacks by police and protesters.
We were there when another protest popped up for the third day in a row. Today, about 30 people led a peaceful march around the Bear County Courthouse, chanting no justice, no peace, no racist police, and Black Lives Matter. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar also showed up with several deputies and marched alongside the group. Tonight, we speak with Sheriff Salazar coming up in our KSAT Q&A. A discussion over race continues on the east side. One business owner hoping to honor George Floyd's memory while remaining peaceful. On the side of a building, now sits a mural with a message. This is a live look right now at that mural. A halo placed on George Floyd's image among the clouds. It was placed on Big Papa's Tacos near I-35 and New Braunfels. The owner of the restaurant called on an artist to paint Floyd's portrait and help his voice be heard. The muralist behind the portrait says, he hopes it will further of movement towards change. Um, hopefully I can paint, you know, more murals like this um, that will definitely inspire the community to, you know, come together as, as instead of separating. And I hope that this mural can be the focal point of that movement in San Antonio. A councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan, whose district covers the east side, acknowledged the pain that came from George Floyd's death. She also made a point to say San Antonio has a police department that she believes is truly here to serve and protect. I want him to burn in hell. And I know that's not a very Christian thing to say. I don't have forgiveness for him. Strong words tonight after parents lay their daughter to rest this afternoon. Their daughter, 27-year-old Miranda Malowski, was a victim of domestic violence who allegedly died at the hands of her ex and the father of her children. The night team's Jaffney Gray with an exclusive interview with both of her parents. They hope their daughter's story encourages abuse survivors to reach out for help. A, a tiny, thin girl and this guy savagely killed her, you know? I mean, what a coward. Scott and Kelly Malowski, the parents of 27-year-old Miranda Malowski, have been reeling in pain since May 24th, the day 27-year-old Michael Gonzalez allegedly stabbed Miranda several times before she jumped out of a moving vehicle to save her life. I knew that she was still there on the ground, and I couldn't go to her. And she was laying there. Before dying, Miranda was able to give witnesses all the information deputies needed to find Gonzalez, who crashed his vehicle before hiding at a nearby residence. She also mentioned, make sure you tell my kids I love them. That was her last word. That words. was her last word. Yeah. Miranda leaves behind three young children she shared with Gonzalez. They know daddy hurt mommy. They know mommy. They know mommy can't come home anymore and that she's in heaven. They say Miranda, a smart, beautiful woman who strived to make people happy, was in and out of an abusive relationship with Gonzalez for eight years. She wanted to make her kids happy, so she would go back and try to work it out with him. They say Miranda did report abuse to police when they lived in California, but Gonzalez was never charged. Her parents say Miranda left Gonzalez in February and moved to San Antonio to pursue her passion to become a corrections officer two days after she graduated. They say Gonzalez showed up and wanted to talk, and he took her on one last drive. She didn't want him or need him, and he was, you know, the old saying if you know I can't have you nobody is not even our children through her grief a heartbroken mother sends a message to others trying to get out of abusive relationships don't do the one last drive don't do the one last talk don't do the one last visit because literally those those are the last visits for everybody Jaffney Gray case at 12 news Gonzalez is still in the Bear County Jail facing a murder charge. Bond is $600,000. If you are in a domestic violence relationship, call BCSO at 210-335-6070 to speak with a domestic violence victim advocate. We also have a long list of resources for you on our website, ksat.com slash domestic violence. Turning now to the coronavirus crisis in San Antonio, HEB now confirming a case of COVID-19 at a manufacturing plant. HEB says people at that location were notified. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says contact tracing is expected to happen to help contain the virus there. In a statement, the store says they closely follow USDA and CDC recommendations and quote, per the CDC, the coronavirus cannot be transmitted through food, end quote. 
Tonight, Bear County has 2,839 confirmed cases of COVID-19. 1,722 people have recovered, leaving just a little more than 1,000 active cases right now. Tonight, 93 people are in the hospital. The number of deaths, sadly, though, has increased by one for a total of 75. Today marked the start of the eviction process for some, but if you live in an income qualified housing area or pay rent with a voucher, the eviction process will remain on hold until next month. The city and the county is still getting the word out on their emergency housing assistance programs. The city helps pay rent or mortgage for those in need. So far, more than 17 million of the $25 million has been earmarked to help families, but there is still room to help others in need. There are just some qualifications you will need to fall under. That means somebody who's making around $50,000 for an individual or $72,000 for a family of four, they must prove an economic hardship related to COVID. So they lost their job, they reduced their hours, or maybe there was an emergency expense, or maybe they had childcare they had to pay for and they could not make their housing or payment. For more information on the housing assistance program, you can call 311. It's still ahead on the night beat. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar will join us live for tonight's KSAT Q&A. His march alongside protesters today. We we'll also hope to talk to him about the latest effects on the jail from this coronavirus pandemic. And with some disinfectant products becoming hard to find, some are asking about alternatives like hydrogen peroxide. Will it work? And are there any dangers to consider? It's coming up next in KSAT's Trust Index. With initial shortages and a rush to sanitize surfaces, people have been thinking outside the box when it comes to cleaning their home and their workspaces. Wipes and bleach flew off the shelves, leaving the internet to swirl with claims about other products capable of killing COVID-19. One such product? hydrogen peroxide. Many viewers have asked if it can be used as a disinfectant. So the night team's Courtney Friedman ran it through our KSAT Trust Index. You, our viewers, are wondering if it's okay to use hydrogen peroxide to disinfect your surfaces. Well, our experts have a multifaceted answer. Hydrogen peroxide is listed on the CDC's website. Dr. Ruth Berggren with UT Health San Antonio's Long School of Medicine says hydrogen peroxide can, in fact, kill COVID-19. But that doesn't mean it's the best thing to use. 3% hydrogen peroxide, which is what you can buy over the counter at the drugstore, is actually a higher concentration than what you generally see in the disinfectants. Uh, and the registered disinfectants are it's around 1.4%, which is about half of that. So the potential risk you run with using that 3% that you buy in the drugstore is it can be corrosive. It might bleach surfaces. It might actually cause some breakdown of surfaces. University Health System Hospital epidemiologist Dr. Jason Bowling says there are specific sprays you can buy that contain hydrogen peroxide in lower concentrations, and those are okay for your surfaces. Dr. Bergren also added the fact that these hydrogen peroxide bottles a lot of us keep under our cabinets for a while can actually expire. I looked at mine for my house. The expiration date is in 2017. Whoops, that's one reason she says you could use alcohol or bleach. I just bought a gallon of bleach for my household last weekend. Um, and what you wanna do is to put five tablespoons of bleach in a gallon of water, or you can do four teaspoons in a quart. So when it comes to using hydrogen peroxide as a COVID-19 disinfectant, our KSAT Trust Index says, be careful. It can work, but might ruin your stuff. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now, if you have a claim, picture, or video you'd like us to check out, you can submit it to us at ksat.com slash trustindex. Happening tomorrow, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg will deliver his State of the City address at 7 p.m. We will carry it live right here on KSAT 12. Among several issues facing the city, the mayor expected to discuss recent protests, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the city's response and recovery in relation to both, both our health recovery and economic recovery. We'll have it for you live tomorrow at 7. Mean meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam. 74 degrees out there. Start to the work week and uh, so far so good.
Yeah, I'd say so. Right, we had some good downpours over parts of the weekend, especially on Sunday. We had some good rainers out there. All right, let's talk about our weather headlines here. More scattered rain as we get into tomorrow. And then it's going to be sunny for the second half of the week and into the upcoming weekend. And then beyond that, we really just need to keep an eye on the tropics and the Gulf and see what the current tropical depression three has to offer and uh, really throws out there. So let's talk about all of it. First of all, with a look at our radar as we had uh, some showers popping up here and there throughout the day today, and we have more out there right now. Just far east of San Antonio, highly isolated, but a good downpour developed near Hallettsville over the past few hours, and it even electrified a little bit, and that pushed off to the northwest, leaving it in its wake a few tenths of an inch of rain estimated by the Doppler radar. Otherwise, we don't have really anything else to speak of out there at the moment, but we are expecting more to pop up and develop as we get through the day tomorrow. Now, this is all in response to the same upper level low that was affecting us over the weekend. This upper level swirl, this counterclockwise circulation, it's broad, but it's got that energy associated with it to really help kickstart some of those showers and storms. And luckily with the composition of our atmosphere right now, we're not looking at the threat for severe weather, just Heavy downpours here and there, widely separated with a little bit of lightning and thunder. That's about it. Now this does move out of town in the coming days, and that's going to drop our rain chances. So tomorrow scattered 40%. And then as we get on into Wednesday down to a 20% chance the rest of the week, at best a 10% shot. But it's all right. At least we've had some very good soaking rainfall over the past couple of weeks. Now what we're watching here in the Bay of Campeche is this broad circulation. Tropical in nature, that's Tropical Depression 3, likely to become Tropical Storm Cristobal later on tonight or especially as we get on into tomorrow. Likely to strengthen a little bit, but there's a lot of uncertainty with this. It's good because it's going to be a drifter. It's in the southern Gulf of Mexico here, Bay of Campeche. Notice by Wednesday, still there, had likely not to move much. Then we get into Friday, still hasn't moved very much. It's just backtracking on itself, dumping a lot of rainfall in parts of southern Mexico. And then by Saturday, best estimates right now is it just starts to push northward into the Gulf of Mexico. If this affected Texas weather in any, any way, shape or form, it wouldn't be until the earlier middle part of next week. All right. And even then, a lot of uncertainty with that. So it's just a wait and see. We'll keep an eye on it. Nothing to worry about. 83 degrees was our high today after a low of 71 and for the most part, we're in the 70s right now. 74 at the airport in town. Divine 71. New Braunfels at 75. And, well, mostly 70s. And actually, the whole state is predominantly in the 70s. So we're all very similar right now, temperature-wise. Looking at the dew point, you feel the stickiness. And that adds to those tropical downpours that we've been seeing. And we're going to see some more of those tomorrow. As I mentioned, about 40% coverage across South Texas. And a little more cloud cover than sunshine. 70 in the morning. 86 by the afternoon, and then once we see those rain chances fall off, as we were talking about middle of the week and end of the week, the temperatures climb a little bit. So back to a sunny pattern by Thursday on through the upcoming weekend, and that means it's going to be a little bit hotter as well with highs back into the mid 90s. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. A strong statement by the NBA commissioner today, Greg. Yes, exactly. How can the NBA help heal a nation that is greatly divided? When we come back, we hear from Adam Silver's statement to his own staff. And also, baseball has a huge problem. And it comes down to the owners against the players and when they can return. Coming up. Spurs head coach Greg Popovich and former Spur now Golden City Warriors head coach Steve Kerr are part of a brand new committee formed by the NBA Coaches Association on racial injustice and reform to pursue solutions in all NBA cities. Joining Pop and Kerr on the committee formed in the wake of the death of George Floyd in police, in police custody, the protests that have allowed across and followed across the United States, included here in San Antonio, now include Lloyd Pierce, Dave Bidsdale, and J.B. Bickerstaff and others. The committee is scheduled to meet tomorrow, according to ESPN, following a Zoom meeting on Saturday involving all NBA coaches. The NBA Coaches Association issued this statement today, and it reads in part, as NBA coaches, both head and assistant coaches, we lead groups of men, most of whom are African-American, and we see, hear, and share their feelings of disgust, frustration, helplessness, and anger. The events of the past few weeks, police brutality, racial profiling, and the weaponization of racism are shameful, inhumane, and intolerable. We are committed to working in our NBA cities with local leaders, officials, and law enforcement agencies to create positive change in our communities. We have 
have the power and platform to affect change, and we will use it. As NBA Commissioner Adam Silver prepares to reopen the league following the shutdown caused by the coronavirus, now he's shifted his focus to address the death of George Floyd in police custody and the resulting protests across America, including here in San Antonio. In a memo sent to league staff members obtained by USA Today, Silver wrote, just as we are fighting a pandemic, which is impacting communities and people of color more than anyone else, we are being reminded that there are wounds in our country that have never healed. The statement continued with this. Racism, police brutality, and racial injustice remain part of the everyday life in America and not be ignored. At the same time, those who serve and protect our communities honorably and heroically are again left to answer for those who don't. We have to reach out, listen to each other, work together to be part of the solution. And as an organization, we need to do everything in our power to make a meaningful difference. Spurs sharpshooter Marco Bellinelli also getting involved in protests have resulted in the death of George Floyd by writing this today on his Twitter account. I'm a caucus. Caucasian man, a white athlete. I live in a privileged situation, but I don't want to be silent while my black people are fighting for their rights. We are in this together. Please don't be silent. Black lives matter. The NBA Board of Governors will vote on the return to play proposal this Thursday, and it appears the 22 team format will be a play that play in tournament, I should say, before the playoffs is the most popular scenario. It would include the top 16 teams and in addition to the teams that are least within six games of the eighth and final playoff spot. That would include the Spurs, who are four games back of the Memphis Grizzlies for the eighth and final playoff spot in the Western Conference with games scheduled to start July 31st at the Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Legendary Auburn football coach Pat Dye passed away today. One of the winningest coaches in school history, Dye today was in hospice care due to kidney failure and liver failure. Earlier, his son Pat Dye Jr. had told us his father tested positive for coronavirus, but he was asymptomatic. Inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 2005, Dye coached the Tigers in 1981 to 1982 and during his 12 seasons at Auburn had a record of 99 39 and 4 winning six bowl games the national coach of the year 1983 and was three-time SEC coach of the year Pat Dye leaves us at the age of 80. Major League Baseball is no closer to resuming as both the owners and the players battle over pay and amount of games to be played. The latest proposal coming from the Major League Baseball Players Association, which includes a 114-game schedule that would start on June 30th and end the regular season on October 31st, and have players earning 70% of their salary. That is quite a divide between the owner's proposal that includes only 82-game schedule, with the highest-paid players in the league, such as Mike Trout and Garrett Cole, receiving less than 23% of their salaries. Now, late this afternoon, if the two sides cannot come to an agreement, the owners are offering the possibility of a 50 game season that would start in July with players being paid their full prorated salaries. This offer, according to ESPN, would have the players only receiving just under 31 percent of their salaries. The owner's concern is that they will lose money for every game play without fans and the fear of a second wave of the coronavirus. Brad Keselowski was able to score his second win of the season as NASCAR enjoys a successful return to live racing during the COVID-19 pandemic. But the supermarket Heroes 500 at Bristol Motor Speedway with no fans wasn't decided almost the last lap when Keselowski had capitalized on Chase Elliott's misfortune again for his second win in the last three races. Keselowski was in third place at the time. Joey Logano leading over Elliott with Chase giving Chase with just three laps remaining. But then disaster strikes for Elliott who makes contact with Logano putting them both into the wall. Keselowski just drives by for the victory. That's after he won the Coca-Cola 600 for the first time last Sunday when Elliott decided to pit. The caution flag came out. So far, it is not Chase Elliott's year. So far, it is Brad Keselowski's year by far. And when Keselowski said we should all go to Vegas. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Our case at Q&A is coming up. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar joins us live next. It's the part of the show where we used to have something called coronavirus Q&A, but we are actually changing it to something called KSAT Q&A because the topics that we're going to stick to aren't just about coronavirus, certainly not in the changing news atmosphere that we find ourselves in. And ironically, I asked Sheriff Javier Salazar, Bear County Sheriff, to join us to talk about coronavirus in the jail, and we may get to that. But first, uh, we expanded it so we can talk about the issues that are happening over the weekend and with the protests, some of the, the violent criminals that we saw out there as well. I, I'm curious tonight as you or, or any night when you sit at home over the last few days and you see some of these protests turn violent. What are you thinking as you watch? 
I'm just thinking, uh, you know, I hope every every one of those first responders makes it home safely. Uh, and I and I also hope that the peaceful protesters that were there on what we were seeing on TV uh, got to say their what they came there to say, got to express what they came there to express before the, the bad actors took over and, and hijacked their operation. Sheriff, I imagine it's a very complicated time right now to be a law enforcement officer. How are your deputies doing? How are they handling this? Well, you know, I, I, they're, they're handling it well. I mean, they, they know that it's, it's all part of the job. You know, the other day I was talking to a cadet class, uh, kind of using this as a teachable moment. And I was telling them that I came on when I came on as a police officer uh, was in the aftermath of Rodney King. And so, you know, we were seeing riots, we were seeing all that kind of stuff. Thankfully, it was, we weren't affected here in San Antonio, but we came on with that same sentiment and just people were, were down on law enforcement. They weren't real crazy about us. And, and I, I think that unfortunately, uh, my young troops are getting a taste of that now. And so we're, we're doing everything that we can to counteract it. Uh, we're letting the public know that, look, we stand with you on this issue. Uh, George Floyd was, was absolutely murdered and it's a travesty. Uh, and we believe uh, that the that he, you know, the the officer officers in this case need to be held accountable. You, you you talked earlier about the fact that about the delicate balance that's going on, and that you hope this doesn't become an us versus them type right. scenario. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, so you know, usually when when you have protesters, I think they expect it to be an adversarial. Uh, type type encounter. So like today I had I had some protesters at the Bear County Courthouse and when I got out of the car they were a little standoffish. They were looking at me as I was walking up and, and they were a little well what's what's this guy gonna do? You know I'm, I'm walking out uh, you know with, with deputies uh, around and I first thing I did was I stopped about about 40 feet short and I said hey can I approach you guys and, and they were they were happy to hear that. So I approached and I, I took my mask off, maintained my distance, I was able to talk to them but we just engaged in a dialogue. And right off the bat, I said, look, I'm not I don't we don't mean you guys any harm. We're actually here to protect your right to to uh, protest peacefully. Uh, and, and then we got to talking about some ideas that we each had. Uh, Sheriff, you know, prior to this weekend, we saw protests across the country. Um, were you surprised to see what happened here in San Antonio over the weekend? You, you know, he sees. That whole day leading up to it, I was getting calls from act, from folks in the activist community. I was getting calls from attorneys. Uh, shoot, even some of the legislators were calling me. And I just kept telling my wife I was doing my, my honeydews. I knew I was going to go into work that night. And I was telling my wife, I said, gosh, this one just feels different. I, I just feel like something's something's different about this one. And, and I just kept telling her. I didn't, of course, I didn't want to freak her out. Um, and then going to work. You know, we, we saw the peaceful folks doing what they what they needed to do, what they felt they needed to get out and get off their chest. And even then, as it was getting darker, myself and some of those those of us that are veteran officers were seeing we're thinking, man, when it when it gets dark is when it's going to be the true test. Yeah. Do you think what we're seeing here is is peaceful protesters and then some agitators that are that are mixed into the whole thing that that maybe are just they wanted to fester some of the open wounds that the George Floyd uh, encounter has opened? Absolutely. And, and, and I'll be honest with you. I think that there's a good portion of those that are coming out and, and rioting and looting that really, quite frankly, don't care about George Floyd. Uh, they just see this as an opportunity to stoke up some anarchy. They see this as an opportunity to, to you know, inflict uh, harm on, on other people or personal you know, property damage to, to small businesses, large businesses. I think they just thrive on on disorder, uh, and and quite frankly, I bet you if you ask most of them, they wouldn't be able to tell you why they're out there, uh, why the the peaceful protesters are out there protesting. Uh, they're there for a totally diff totally different purpose. Uh, Sheriff, I want to ask you one more question about about the um, this moment that we're in before we move on to uh, asking you a little bit about the coronavirus. You mentioned this being a teachable moment. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're using what happened here with George Floyd, this killing of George Floyd, to train your own officers or deputies? I went in and I spoke to one of my cadet classes the other day. So my law enforcement cadet. So these these deputies these are deputies that have worked in the jail for a couple of years and now they're about to cross over to law enforcement. So they're going to be on the streets of Bear County before too long. Um, we teach a, a program called EPIC at the Sheriff's Office. Ethical policing is courageous. 
And if I had to lump all of Epic into one thing, it's, it's basically teaching you to speak up if you see an, a, a fellow officer acting up, either administratively or even criminally. You say something, you do something. And, and so I, I pointed that out to my deputies, the, the cadets in the class, and I said, look, the, the, what, what the, the, the officer did that, that actually killed uh, Mr. Floyd, that's, that's one thing. That's bad in and of itself. But pay attention to the other three. Uh, the other three stood by and did nothing. Can you imagine? Had one of them simply leaned over to, to, to this officer and said, hey, knock it off. Let's, let's get your knee off this guy. Let's, let's put him in the car and let's just go handle our business and go book him. Uh, all of this would have been avoided. Millions of dollars in, in property damage, lost lives, lost uh, you know, injured injuries to civilians and officers alike could have been avoided if one cop had just spoken up and done the right thing. I want to shift gears here quickly. We have a, a little under two minutes left. It, talk about the situation at the jail with COVID-19. I guarantee you there is not a sheriff in the country that thought, man, when I win election, I'm going to get to deal with a pandemic. How difficult has that been? It's, it's been crazy because we're writing the book as we go. And, and, I'll, and I'll be honest, you know, it's good with us. We've got good partners in, in UHS and in Metro Health and in the fire department that was coming in and helping us do our thing. Uh, we, we've had some really good partners in this. And I, I think it feels like we're on the uh, way on the downhill slope on this now. You know, every day we get a couple of, of, of you know, every couple of days we'll get a couple of positives here and there. But I think that we've, we've pretty much weathered the storm for now. We know there's a second wave coming. We've still got 86 uh, COVID positive inmates currently in house. The vast majority of those, I believe 83 of them have no symptoms at all though. So it, it's not what you would picture. Uh, and, and most of our inmates that have tested positive uh, have, have been asymptomatic. Yeah, and TDCJ not allowing the transfer of inmates, I imagine has also <laughs> complicated things. How long are you prepared to retain those prisoners should this continue? Well, we, we've got no choice. I mean, we've got to retain them. Uh, but right now we're sitting on about 275 of their inmates. Uh, plus from some of the other uh, treatment programs, the, some of the county ones, we're sitting on, oh, uh, 30 some odd of, of theirs. And so we're sitting on 300 inmates that, that technically are not ours. They belong yeah. elsewhere. I mean, we've got to make do. We've got to house them. Uh, but that's a frustrating thing. That's costing Bear County taxpayers a lot of money on a daily basis to house those 300 people. Sheriff Javier Salazar, we appreciate you staying up late with us on the night beat. Thanks, guys. All right, take care. Thank you. Well, tonight, President Donald Trump threatening to use military police to quell violence and looting across the country. This as the family of George Floyd and their sympathizers seek additional charges against the officers involved in his death. ABC's Alex Perche has more from Minneapolis. Tonight, an America divided over the president's use of force. In an address from the Rose Garden, President Trump announcing his plan to use active duty army troops to, quote, dominate protesters. The president calling the violence and looting seen in some cities domestic terrorism. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. Trump using Washington, D.C. as an example. This is a video of National Guardsmen clearing Lafayette Park before his address, though the protesters here were peaceful. Is that your Bible? It's a Bible. D.C.'s Episcopal Bishop saying this on CNN. Uh, the president just used a Bible and one of the churches of my diocese without permission as a backdrop for a message antithetical to the teachings of Jesus. The remarks coming the same day as George Floyd's grief-stricken younger brother Terrence made a trip to Minneapolis. All day we've seen sympathizers come by and drop off flowers for George Floyd and his family. And today, his brother Terrence got a chance to see this too. Terrence's knees buckling as he approached the memorial. Dropping to the street, tearfully speaking to his lost brother. I need you and Pops to watch over me. I know you got me. I know what you want. His message to the crowd, a strong one, demanding the violence stop. My family is a peaceful family. My family is God fearing and encouraging we'll people to vote. Not just vote for the president, vote for the preliminaries, vote for everybody. 
Former officer Derek Chauvin under suicide watch charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. Two autopsy reports released today, both ruling Floyd's death a homicide. The Floyd family also pressing for arrests of the other three officers involved to be charged with murder. What's his name? George Floyd! What's his name? George Floyd! Alex Perche, ABC News, Minneapolis. Around the nation, new worries of a second wave of COVID-19. That story coming up after the break. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. This week, two of the nation's biggest issues now colliding. As Americans flood the streets in protest over the death of George Floyd, medical experts worrying that close contact could ignite new outbreaks of COVID-19. ABC's Romina Puga has more. With tens of thousands of people protesting George Floyd's death, packing streets and parks, some wearing masks, others going without, American health officials fear one crisis could amplify the other. We are really worried that this might be a trigger for more uh, COVID infections. The coronavirus is already hitting black and brown communities hardest, and that's who's mostly out in the streets. Atlanta's mayor is encouraging demonstrators to get tested. If you were out protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week. The close contact, vigorous yelling and exhaling, and coughing due to tear gas, all circumstances that could exacerbate the spread of the virus. How many young people went home and kissed their mother hello or shook hands with their father or hugged their father or their grandfather or their grandmother or their brother or their sister and spread a virus. And evidence of the virus's spread is plentiful. A new positive case in Missouri was traced to a crowded swim-up bar at the Lake of the Ozarks over Memorial Day weekend. In these 15 states in Puerto Rico, places like South Carolina and California, where protests have been large, the number of newly reported cases is already increasing. And the chaos caused by more violent protests has led some testing sites in L.A. County to close over the weekend for safety. The disarray also shutting down food banks in Chicago and Philadelphia. That food being distributed to those in need, many who'd become unemployed because of the pandemic. And despite city curfews, on Tuesday, eight states plus D.C. are heading to the polls. The D.C. curfew does not apply to voters, election officials, or poll workers. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Bear County continuing to help local business owners safely reopen and operate during the COVID-19 pandemic. This morning, the county actually distributed thousands of plexiglass barriers to business owners at the AT&T Center. About 2,000 people pre-registered for the event, something County Commissioner Tommy Calvert is encouraging all local business owners to do. This is your taxpayer dollar money being reinvested in you and take advantage of these opportunities as a small business owner uh, to get a little return and to keep safe. We may see another wave uh, coming in the next couple of weeks. So we feel good about the fact that we can get the protective equipment out, deployed and make things as safe as possible. If you're a business owner and are in need of a plexiglass, plex, plexiglass barrier, there are two other distributions scheduled for this week. You can find more information and a link to register on ksat.com. No child should go without a meal. And Northeast ISD is continuing its part in making sure mouths in its district are being fed. The school district is actually extending its curbside meal program through the month of June. Meal packs are being given to any child who needs one at no charge this week. The first distribution was today. Those packs include breakfast and lunch for two days. Another distribution is set for Wednesday and contains five days worth of breakfast and lunch. You can visit Northeast ISD's website for more information on pickup locations and times. Take a live look outside with live cam this evening. Hard to believe that a week ago we were dealing with a lot of rain and no such thing today. And right before yeah. that, remember, we were almost talking about watering restrictions. Yeah. So <laughs> the rain came and uh, changed all that. It's amazing how much can change in a short period of time. Absolutely. And yeah, we were just a handful, not even, about three or four weeks ago talking about watering restriction being watering restrictions being right around the corner and that's far from the case right now. I mean the aquifer up a tenth of a foot today, but here's the key. We're up to 672.2. So we're 12 feet above the critical 660 point 
which is when we can start seeing those restrictions. And we're nine and a half feet above average for the month of June. Mold is high at 8,000 whenever we get into these damp periods and good, uh, good rainfall patterns. It always comes at a bit of a cost and that's with a higher mold. Take a look at this picture from Dilly. This is nice. Rainfall yesterday and today. Over two inches of rainfall in that rain gauge. So it's nice to see that. Now, not everybody had that type of accumulation. Some of us didn't see anything, but there were some pockets. See that near Dilly right there, that yellow? Some pockets of really good rainfall and accumulations over the past 48 hours. So it's nice to see this, especially along the coastal bend, which is one part of our area that really needs the rainfall and still in drought also. Maverick County and around Eagle Pass still in a drought, so it's good to get that. You look at the radar over the past three hours and one downpour popped up near Hallettsville and that quickly moved out of town and pushed out of our area and now has dissipated. So nothing left out there. Can't rule out a sprinkle tomorrow morning and then some more scattered activity in the afternoon. But what we're also watching in the tropics, Tropical Depression 3 likely to become a tropical storm. And this is a weak system that's just going to drift in the Bay of Campeche. Look at this track and the potential track here as we get into Wednesday, the middle part of the week. Hardly moved. Thursday, Friday, minimal movement. The circle, by the way, indicates the potential error in this path. So it could end up anywhere within that circle, but still, that's not much of a change all the way through Friday, the end of the work week. We get into Saturday and it might kick northward into parts of the Gulf there. So just something for us to watch, nothing to worry about. Temperature wise, 70s just about everywhere across the state. Fredericksburg and Kerrville at 69. Del Rio's 78. New Braunfels right now, you're at 74. Look how temperatures climb a bit later this week. We'll get more sunshine. That'll boost readings up into the mid 90s by the end of the week and into the upcoming weekend. But tomorrow we'll start the day at 70, then top out at 86. About 40% chance of rain, so some scattered pop-up downpours again. A little bit of lightning and thunder possible. We get into Wednesday, those rain chances fall off, and then it's off to a sunny stretch Thursday into the upcoming weekend. EC Steve? Thank you, Adam. Sunscreen is vital to protecting your skin, especially in the summer months. We'll tell you which products get top marks coming up next. Sunscreens put to the test. Even on a cloudy day, you can get burned. But as we head into summer, that means more time at the pool and more sun exposure. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz tells us which products get top ratings. A sunburn is no day at the beach. So whether you head to the coast or get some stay at home sunshine, you should protect your skin. You don't need to be on a beach to get burned. No matter where you are outside, you need to apply sunscreen to any exposed skin even if it's cloudy out or not super hot. Store shelves are filled with choices, so Consumer Reports put several lotions and sprays to the test. The two that got top ratings are also CR Best Buys. They won't burn your budget. Trader Joe's Spray, SPF 50 plus. And if you prefer a lotion, Copper Tone Ultra Guard SPF 70. It's important to note all of CR's best rated sunscreens contain an ingredient called oxybenzone, which is a very effective UV filter. The concern with oxybenzone is that there's some evidence that it's absorbed through the skin more than previously thought. That doesn't necessarily mean it's unsafe, but the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests parents may want to use oxybenzone-free sunscreen on their kids. The highest scoring oxybenzone-free sunscreen in their tests are Hawaiian Tropic Sheer Touch Ultra Radiance Lotion SPF 50 and Hawaiian Tropic Silk Hydration Weightless Lotion SPF 30. They're not at the top of the ratings, but we're still highly protective. A common mistake is not using enough. Dermatologists say be generous. And when you're shopping for sunscreen, look for broad spectrum on the label and an SPF no less than 30. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, stick with us. We're going to tell you where you can pick up a free donut all week long. Coming up. And no matter the hour, we are always online at ksat.com. Our web team is keeping track of the coronavirus pandemic with the latest numbers and the many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. We have an entire page dedicated to the effort. It's all online at ksat.com. 
Well, ATT's new streaming service HBO Max is up and running and we now know that it picked up 87,000 new users on its first day of release last Wednesday. That's according to data from Sensor Tower. The numbers are lower than other platforms like Disney Plus, which picked up 5 million at its launch. Warner Media Entertainment chair Bob Greenblatt says he said he doesn't want HBO Max to be a replacement for popular streaming services like Netflix or Amazon, but to also be an option alongside them. All right, a heads up for donut lovers of those who just like getting stuff for free, if you like that as well. Krispy Kreme is giving away free donuts all week. National Donut Day is this Friday, but the donut shop decided to make a little change, make it donut week. Anytime this week, Monday through Friday, your favorite donut is free. <clears throat> just pick a day, pick a donut, Enjoy. Those look really good. They do. They do look so good. good. I'm so How late is right uh, Krispy Kreme? Yeah. <laughs> is the light on? Close. Yeah, that's what that was like. <laughs> yeah. what? How late is it open? All right, that does it for the night beat. Don't forget, good morning, San Antonio. Oh, never mind. We're going to hey, do some yeah, weather. I was going to say, is the orange light on here? And then you can go. Yeah, in. exactly. Yeah. Open, yeah. yeah. The kids know that pretty darn well, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Otherwise, take a look at the forecast tomorrow. Some scattered pop up downpours again, just like what we had yesterday. And then we get toward the middle and end of the week and our rain chances really fall off. It's just going to be sunny then in mid 90s. And we'll keep an eye on the tropical depression in the Gulf and let you know. But right now, no threat. GMSA at 430 in the morning. Good night.